So my name is Ruth. Um, I am currently a third year medical student at the University of Sheffield and I also have a degree in biomedical science um, from the University of Plymouth where I got first class. So I've got a science background and um, did my education mainly in Ireland and now I'm doing medicine here in Sheffield. So hi, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm talking to myself, but so give me a wave or a hello, or you can drop a comment or something. It's gonna be quite interactive. I know it's the last session, so you might be a bit tired, but just a wave, hello, something. So I know you're there. I think Yes, thank you for the Kemi. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys, in this session. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, okay, I got some nods. Fab. So the first thing I wanted to talk about in the doctor-patient relationship is about communication. And this is so important to medicine because it's not just about giving information, it's about how you give information. And it's also about understanding the context of the patients that you're gonna be speaking to. Cause you're gonna establish, you wanna establish a good relationship with patients. Like medicine, a lot of it is you are speaking to people at very, very vulnerable moments in their lifetime. So you wanna be able to build trust in those relationships. And you'll hear a lot about patient-centered care. And one of the ways in which you can kind of um, explore this is through good effective communication and you'll see through medicine they'll talk about poor communication which leads to so many complaints but I want to kind of give you guys a little bit of insight into communication one of the key ways it is expressed in medicine um, I remember when I started medicine they told us that through medical school students like their empathy decreases. So hopefully from today, you'll remember to retain your empathy if you do choose to um, follow with medicine. Now, one of the things that can be a barrier to doctor-patient relationships is jargon, medical jargon. If you've watched any TV shows, Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs, things like that, you've probably heard words that you don't understand, but not just on TV shows, in real life, doctors can sometimes use words that really kind of prove to be barriers to the patients that they're speaking with. So for example, I've got these three words here, crepitus, I have got rhinorrhea, and I've got horripilation. Between us here, does anybody know what these words mean? If you do, that's great. If you don't, just say. No? No? I'm getting a lot of shakes of the head. Okay. What about if I said cracking joints? Would you know what I'm talking about then if I said when you crack your fingers, things like that, you get what I'm saying? Yeah? Or what about if I said a runny nose or a cold? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Or what about if I said goosebumps. You know what I'm talking about, yeah? That's kind of what it is. You spent, I think, in your first year of medical school, you learn about 4,000 new words, they told us at the start, which is essentially like learning a whole different language. But then by the time you leave medicine, you have to come back to thinking like someone who doesn't know all those words and being able to kind of articulate it, depending on the context of the patient you're speaking with. Right. So I know you guys might not have all the complex terms, but I still want you guys to be able to apply the principle. So we're going to have two um, little cases that we're going to try and use this principle with. Right. So we have Jason, who's a 79 year old. Um, let's say Jason's my grandfather. He's 79 year old and he doesn't have a smartphone. And I want you guys to try and explain what TikTok is to Jason. But we've also got Ife, who is a four year old. And she's just starting school and I want you guys to try and explain what empathy is. I want everybody to have a go. You can do one or the other or you can try to do both. But just give it your best shot of how you would be able to explain it to a 79 year old, doesn't have a phone, doesn't have a smartphone. And then Ife, who's a four year old and she's just about to start school. Make sense? Yeah, I think you should be able to unmute yourselves. So who wants to go first or I will just pick. I'll go first. Go for it. Yes. So um, for TikTok, um, it's, a, it's an app on your phone in which you can watch people do dances to music. OK. OK. Um, OK. Anybody else want to try TikTok? Oh, I was going to explain empathy. OK, go for empathy. So my sister's name is actually Fair, so that's kind of funny. Um, let's, I would tell the four year let's say you have a little friend next to you and you both got a lollipop and your friend breaks theirs, it drops on the floor or whatever, and they can't eat it anymore. Empathy would be understanding that your friend doesn't have a lollipop anymore and it's okay for them to be sad about it. And even though you have a lollipop, you can relate to how they feel because they don't have one. And you might share it with them, you might try to get them a new one, something like that. 
Okay, okay. Anybody else? Or I will pick. Let's go with. Go yeah, go for it, Mo. TikTok. I was going to say about TikTok, but it's like like a place where basically you can like make a video of yourself doing something and then upload it there for people to see and like give feedback and stuff. Okay. Okay. Nice. Anybody else? I'd say that he is like being able to feel bad for someone and understand how they feel. Okay. Yeah. And who have we got left? Who have we got? Jojo. Um, for the TikTok one, I'd say that it's an app that you can share something and also watch people do a variety of things. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yimika. Um, I guess empathy is like being able to understand how somebody else feels in a situation, even if you're not in that situation yourself. Okay. And then Kitan is last, I think. Um, I think explaining TikTok will be um tell TikTok is a video sharing platform where you can watch other people do stuff that they post on the app. Okay, okay. Well, for me, I think all of you guys did excellently. I think it can be quite difficult sometimes. If this was a real patient, if this was somebody, what would actually happen is they probably would have stopped all of you, especially maybe for TikTok, and they would have said, What's an app? What is that? Right? So, the context of what you're saying, sometimes it makes sense to us because as you go through medicine, things start to become natural, words become familiar. But then you need to come to a point where you're actually going to be able to say, Actually, let me break it down to this person. How would it make sense, especially for them? Because when we have poor communication as doctors or even as medical students, it makes the whole process of providing care a lot longer because a patient could say yes to something that actually they don't have, or they could misunderstand you. And that's where you get a lot of complications a lot of complaints as you go on but well done everybody because that was that was quite good especially with the empathy one as well well done so we're talking about patients now you might have come across the game four pictures and one word right but with these four pictures there's one theme here it's a little bit tricky but I think you might be able to get it and um, just looking at it what do you guys think thinking of patients again thinking of communication what do you think the theme is between these four pictures? And if you can't find a theme, what, just tell me what you can see and you could just unmute yourself. Um, I think maybe that there are so many different ways that you can communicate with different people and that they can like, be okay. interpreted in different settings as well. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Anybody else? Um, I was thinking like variety. Variety, okay, okay. Good. Anyone else? Maybe like understanding. Understanding. Okay. All in the right kind of path. Yeah. Anyone else? No, we'll take what we have, which was good. So with these four pictures, the theme kind of is really four different patient groups that you might actually have to adapt your communication. So when we talked about medical jargon originally, that is just even for the general population. But even with that understanding as medics, you're gonna to have to understand the different patient groups that you're dealing with. So for example, in the top left there, you've got the elderly, you've got children, you might have patients with learning disabilities, you might even have carers. Um, you'll come across something called a collateral history where you're actually going to have to speak to other people. For example, even when somebody faints, the person who fainted might not remember everything that happened or if they had a seizure, you might have to speak to other people. And then the last group of people are people who, where there's a language barrier, English, English might not be their first language, yeah? So there's patient groups that you might have to be a bit more considerate about the type of communication that you're going to use. And I'm gonna give you guys an example that actually happened to me on placement a few weeks ago. So I had, let's say it was an 80 year old male, right, um, on a general, geriatrics ward so a ward for the elderly and they are really really confused sitting in front of you really confused they usually have a hearing aid because they've got hearing loss okay and you're in front of them COVID times so I have a mask on I have a visor and I'm trying to speak to them they 
they don't really hear what I'm saying because they don't have the hearing aid and they're also quite confused. But I've been sent to tell them that they need a chest x-ray because we think they have an infection, but they can't hear me and they're really confused. What would you guys do in that situation? You could write down what you're trying to say and then show it to them. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Um, maybe like take it slow and kind of try to get a conversation with them just to like make them more comfortable maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Somebody else is going to say something. I didn't see you. Um, if there is any chance that the person no sign language and you also know sign language you could use that as a way to communicate very good yeah okay those are three quite good answers and quite um effective ways i think sign language we didn't actually think of that in the moment but what we did do is we started off with what george's idea was was trying to take it slow trying to speak to them but when patients are really confused it it can, it can be quite difficult. But what we ended up doing is what Luke said in the end, getting a piece of paper, writing down the questions. And what you'll see is that sometimes, especially with confusion, you score the patient on how confused they are. And when we actually wrote down the questions for the patient, we realized that they weren't as confused as we thought. They actually understood everything that was happening. But could you imagine if we thought someone was really confused, they had no idea where they were, and then we start making all these decisions for them, not realizing that they're very much aware of what's happening. So things like that, adapting your communication, something small like that is something that you will apply through medical school, right? So moving on, here I've got four different situations. You could have an angry patient, A&E, who's been waiting for hours and hours, seeing everybody go ahead of them. You've got another patient who's actually nearing the end of their life. You've got another patient, let's say, comes into a GP practice and you've got to dis discuss with them about, you know, their bowel habits or something that's embarrassing for them. And then let's say you have another patient who comes in and you are just, you've just found out that they have got a chronic disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, yeah, or something like diabetes, something that's going to impact their life. Of the four of them, and you can either unmute or you can use the chat, where do you think communication is going to be most important? And why? Um, I think maybe it's not. It's, uh, communication is it's important in all of them, especially in the medical field, because you need to make sure that the, the patient understands what's happening. And you need to try and, if it's like an angry patient, you need to try and calm them down and make sure they know what's going on. But it doesn't mean that, like, a patient nearing their end of their life doesn't mean that like communication towards them is less important okay. that makes sense okay. yeah no it does very good point anybody else or anybody disagree with luke maybe or agree um, i think it's the oh i'm sorry go sorry. ahead no, go for it. um i think it's the kind of communication that you have with each patient that's more important than having communication at all in the case okay. of number two you have to be super empathetic or sympathetic i guess um, and understand that there's really not much you can do for them. Whereas three and four, you have to be very careful with your words because it's either embarrassing or it's a lot of medical jargon that they won't understand. So it depends on the, it's more the type of communication you have and how you present your, your words. Okay, thank you for looking at me. Somebody else was gonna say something. Um, yeah, so I would have said maybe the, maybe like with the patient nearing the end of their life, um, you'd have to be like really sensitive and careful about how you give them the information because um, around that, like, I guess when you come to the end of your life, you can be like quite panicked or you might be, you know, really calm. It depends on the person and how they're feeling in the moment. Um, but I also think when it comes to um, discussing potentially embarrassing subjects, um, mm -hmm. maybe like being discreet with how you tell them, like maybe taking the patient to the side away from maybe other people that they're around, um, that can be quite helpful in, you know, uh, helping them not be embarrassed, but also communicating effectively. Amazing, great. Anybody else? Number, somebody said number four as well, okay. Those are really great answers. Um, and I think it's a combination of all those things. I like what you guys said about um, the type of communication. And I think the essence of it is that 
the element of communication within medicine is not necessarily, you're not going to get a textbook that says this is how you communicate. It's almost like an art that's going to have to come through, like as you do medicine, as you meet different patients, you learn and you pick up things, even how you ask questions. You don't always ask questions in the same way to a child. If you were going to ask, you know, an adult, you would change how you ask the question. So in different settings, you're going to have to apply different things. And as much as medicine can be knowledge based, which it is, there's a lot of application of what you've learned and being able to adapt. So it gives you that element of variety in the people that you see, the type of way you're going to communicate, the situations you're going to have to communicate, but being able to actually, like you guys identified, know the when and the how and how to apply it to different groups of people. So that was really great, guys. And um, the last show you guys as well, because we're not just talking about communication from patient to patient, we're also talking about communication within medical careers. And I'm sure maybe you might have already heard from people today, or you might just know yourselves that there's so many options in terms of fields you can go into with medicine. But even trying to apply that communication with different fields, it's not just patient to patient. So you might have um, doctors that work in public health, for example, and their form of communication is very much going to be informing the public, raising awareness, and that could be in things such as screening programs, so preventative measures as well. There might be cases where doctors have to go to court, for example, with psychiatrists, things like that. They may have to represent a patient or they may have to clarify some medical piece of information. Then you've got communication within the different kinds of care. So between a GP practice and the consultants in the hospital, that level of communication between primary and secondary care is so, so key. And it's not something you're necessarily taught textbook, but it's something that you gathered through the degree. Then research. People seem to always think that doctors just do medicine and they just leave everything else. But a lot of doctors are actually involved in research because obviously they've got you know, frontline experience of some of the things that we need to kind of improve in a science element. So if research science is your thing as well, um, those options are still there for doctors, whether academically or more like science-based and lab-based. And then we kind of touched on families as well. Communication with families, whether that's in pediatrics and, you know, with children and their parents, but also we talked a little bit about end of life, so palliative care, those sort of things. It's not just one individual that you might be speaking to. So hopefully you guys have got a bit of a taster um, that would give you a bit more interest for the full course and to kind of see how communication comes into medicine, not just in a standard, just the word empathy, that's the only thing you know, but how do we apply patient-centered care? And more of this would go into depth about like the ethics and things like that and more complex situations. But I hope that has made sense to you guys. If it was a, so yeah, you gave me different scenarios. You gave me a child, um, if someone had a learning disability and then a language barrier. So let's start with language barriers. So there are things in place with language barriers. Like there's actually a system where they have interpreters. So um, I know we would kind of think that, oh, you could just, you know, use a family member, but you've got to think that can pose quite an ethical dilemma if you're using a family member. What if it's something they don't want the family member to know? What if there's, some issues going on here that the family member might not translate everything that you're saying. So there's that complexity. So we actually have systems in place where they can, you can call a number that has an interpreter on it, essentially. So that's the language barrier one. Um, yeah, that's the best practice. Let me put, you might not always see that done in hospital, the appropriate guideline, what you're meant to do for language barriers. And um, with learning disabilities, usually people would have, it's sometimes about knowing like, what is that person's life outside of the hospital, right? And this is good for elderly as well. Like, what is their baseline? So they might have a carer or um, sometimes people have, I don't know what they're called, but almost like tablets sometimes that they can actually type what they want to say or you can, you know, speak it into it and then it types up we're very technological now so there's lots of things that can kind of aid people but it's about knowing okay how do they usually communicate as well like they have a life before this admission how do I get an understanding of what they would do in terms of that sense and then with children children it depends pediatrics goes from basically newborn all the way up into teens so it really depends on the child it depends on um how you've engaged with that child already could be pictures, could be images. Um, yeah, children's a bit of a tricky one just because of like the individuality, but I hope that kind of answers your question. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Um, I actually did want to ask in like terms of uh, like medical field, 
Um, do you guys look at like ethics, like medicine, medicinal ethics, like how that works? Yeah. Do you mean as in ethics, just throughout medicine and like as a doctor? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it does. I know different universities will obviously like approach it differently. Um, but a lot of it, it will come in. It will come literally even pre the medical degree, most universities at the point of your interview, it will come in at some point where you have scenarios and they'll ask you about ethics. So it's something even before you get into medicine, you will you will know the four pillars of ethics. But once you get into medicine, um, you will have it exposed to you in different capacities. So for my university, what we might do is we have like specific ethic lectures, but we'll also have cases where through different specialties, we look at, okay, how would we approach this case? So for example, I said I was on placement and I did elderly care. There's specific situations and issues that relate to the elderly that you'd have to learn about ethics in that sense. So you learn about it, but then you'll be given situations where you've kind of got problem-based cases where you can actually apply it and see what would you would do. Hope that answers yours. <laughs>